Hello, everybody. It's John Pollock and Wei Ting with a post news update. Hello, Wei. Hello, John. Second time we're talking to each other today. This is the second time we are talking today, but the first time you're hearing us, and you are going to get the combined version of two conversations because when we first recorded this earlier, this was before all the names had come out uh, regarding the WWE cuts from Friday. So we wanted to obviously address all of those, and then we'll go into uh, some other topics as well to be discussed. But way before we get into the names, uh, this is the third talent purge this year. It's the third consecutive month that we have had one of these lists come out of all these talents uh, being let go. And I have to imagine that you know, there was a time that this typically would happen once a year and then it stopped for a while. But, you know, it, it was never it was always a terrible event when you had all of these. But at least at the end of it, it was over with. And now, like this is happening much more um, yeah, becoming more of a pattern of all of these cuts. And I would imagine that if you're a performer, there's the concern of a month or two from now. Do we undergo more of these? Oh yeah, I have to imagine. You know, I have to imagine it. It might be a, a feeling you would have at at all times. You know, but it's a very different company from maybe when it was ten years ago or however many years ago. You know, it's a much larger company than than it was back then. And you know, you have up top somebody like a Nick Khan who maybe has very different styles of of management, perhaps with some of these things. So um, it it appears that at least this year, um, this might. Oh, who knows? Well, I, I will say like this one feels a bit more concentrated to the NXT side of things. It is. I mean, th this is like your pr primarily like lower level talent in NXT and 205 live that this affected. This was not main roster cuts, but I would say like this, it feels just from like a surface level, like just a different style of company than even a year ago where you saw all of these initiatives of moving forward of ideas of different satellite groups creating more content and up to the present that's been stephanie's big talking uh, speech when she's going out there is the reason that they ended up leasing the peacock or leasing the wwe network sub licensing it to nbc universal was we don't want to be in the technology space we want to be content creation and yet a lot of these cuts way like this to me it takes an already depleted 205 live roster and lowers it. And it's to me, you're, you're getting rid of a lot of talent that you would think if you're trying to expand, this, this would not be the move to be making when you're lowering your numbers. Like are a lot of these projects that we had heard of, what's the status of them now? Yeah. What is the extent of expansion when, you know, you're talking when, when about you're something? getting paid a guaranteed amount to fulfill to Peacock there's not that same incentive, I would say, to create all of this other programming. And it's still early. Like, we can't really make a... But a year from now, I think we'll be able to look at year one on Peacock. Is it a drastically different output that we're seeing? Because another area that got hit last month was the the whole, like, digital space that was, you know, putting out a lot of that content. Well, I will say... I. I, I'm pretty confident that they still have enough people on that roster to fill a 205 Live once a week. In fact, I mean, they have a lot of people that aren't even on 205 Live that are probably waiting to get onto TV. So, you know, it's um, it, it's a very big company with a very big roster and a lot of people looking for that airtime. Um, you know, the this particular crop of people, I... You know, it's internally, you'd have to ask them why they chose this specific group, but maybe, you know, a combination of uh, numbers that just kind of added up to make the right choices for them. So the names uh, that were reported today, um, and most of these coming courtesy of a PWInsider.com and Fightful.com, Breezango, Tyler Breeze and Fandango with... Uh, Fandango has been part of the company for 15 years since he signed on and was way back in the deep South days before going to FCW was on that NXT season and then got the change over to Fandango in 2013. Tony Nice, Aria Davari and August Gray, all from 205 Live, as is uh, Kurt Stallion, Everrise, who 
I thought it'd become like these were guys that tried to maximize any any on on screen time that they had to try and just I I mean all of these you you feel bad for but to me I always look at ones like that where the guys that have so little but try to maximize the most of what they've got those are the ones to me that if I'm a talent is so deflating because I'm told one thing and try to make something happen for myself that at the end of the day doesn't hold a ton of weight when it comes to these decisions. Uh, the Bollywood I, I, boys. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, well, just on that note, like I, I have to say they are one of the, the the people on this list that surprised me the most because they just appeared on NXT. They have been appearing regularly on NXT and seem to be on some somewhat of an upward trajectory in their careers, which I can't necessarily say for a lot of the other people on this list. So, Well, Brizongo you know, just... I mean, they just went over Imperium and did that angle last week where they they put the flag over top of them. I mean, I don't think any of this is connected strategically. I think this is just like we're tearing Band-Aids off and ongoing storylines be damned. It was I I I just don't think like that. Like it does feel very disjointed when you're shooting an angle one week and the next week they're gone. Um, The Bollywood boys, as I mentioned, Marina Shafir, who we haven't seen in a while, Arturo Huas, and Killian Dane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, some of these other names are are, are somewhat surprising, too, because, I mean, many of them didn't even really get a chance to be on NXT proper, uh, much less the main roster. And, you know, somebody like, for instance, an Arturo Huas or an August Gray, I definitely think you see a lot of potential in some of those. Um, you know, other guys like Aria Davari or Tony Nese, I mean, seem to be, uh, unfortunately, a sort of life or stranded on that 205 Live show. And, you know, which, which I, seems to be just the worst lot to be. I mean, yes, you you have a job, you're on a show. But if you're looking for an upward trajectory, that's a tough show to be on because you're just kind of going in place. Like tonight's 205 Live has two matches and two of the four performers were part of the cuts today. Oh, man. Yeah, a break. <laughs> the really funny tweet from uh, August, August Gray. Gray I mean, the man can never be accused of lacking a, a sense of humor. Where he announced that his match with a uh, Grayson Weller tonight is now a loser leaves town match. <laughs> he spoiled his own match. <laughs> well, you don't know, John. I mean, you know, it could anything could happen, right? But you know, like on. Um, some some of these guys, I, I think I we we you know the silver lining is that somebody like a like a team like an Ever Rise, the fact that they even had any sort of like connection to the WWE and had that TV time to be able to show at least a glimpse of what what they're able to offer the industry at large. I thought you know they can look at this this period as a great advertising moment for them to because I'm sure like there are plenty of other companies that ha- see you know talent and people like that and would want to pick them up, especially you know people with big personalities like them. Uh, what do you see for some of the other names on this list? I think it's a tough way because it's not just you're looking at, you know, these names, but we're talking about two previous cycles of talent that had those no compete clauses that companies are looking at. And when you've got, you know, I, I think it, it's really going to depend. Like um, the fact that uh, MLW was just able to pick up uh, EJ and Duca. Like that to me, like MLW can go after a performer like that. And I, I think they really kind of see the value in we're not going to overspend maybe for the giant names out there, but we can see, you know, future stars and maybe looks at a list like this and some people stand out. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are on the outside of WWE that were previously working for them. And companies can only take so many people in. We're still talking about companies that are coming off a pandemic. Uh, you know, some I'm sure will be will have interest from national promotions, but I can see a lot like that will maybe have to go back to the independents or reassess things. Like there's sadly not going to be, you know, full-time employment for all of these people that have been let go, like it's a pretty big number when you're looking at three separate cycles of releases. Yeah. I mean, it almost seems like it's sort of the opposite of maybe what we've seen before with, you know, the WWE and maybe all these other companies trying to hoard and really pillage the independent scene with all this talent. Now, much of it getting released back, you know, into the wild, maybe so we could say, um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I am hopeful that much of the, people on this roster will be able to kind of find a new identity for themselves when they're outside of this system that, you know, let's be honest for a lot of them weren't necessarily, I can't imagine creatively, creatively fulfilling 
um, you know, being in the a part of the independence or being outside of the company obviously comes with a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty financially, of course. But it also comes with, I think, a great deal of uh, creative freedom um, that I, I hope to see a lot of them explore. Yeah, I think that's always, you know, it's it it's always difficult. But, you know, this is where you, you see people that are really put to the test like this is either going to be something that's really deflating that it's your whole dream is to get to WWE or it's OK, it's life after WWE. And now I'm just going to move on to the next thing. Like you saw Killian Dane immediately put out a thing and stating, you know, I was, I was angry. Interesting to note, Killian Dane noted at the end of his statement, see you in 90 days, as opposed mm-hmm. to 30 that we usually uh, associate with NXT. So it might be um, d- different periods for different, different talent. Well, somebody like Breeze and Fandango, I imagine they, they would be uh, on similar main roster types of contracts. Wouldn't you think? Unless they had been, you know, re- restructured over this time. I mean, they've been down in NXT for two years at this point. So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I do, do you see Breeze and Fandango kind of going out there as, as a pair together? I think that's a that's a really good question. I mean, I think it largely depends what sort what sort of company they they might join with. They are strong as a pairing, but I have to be honest in like saying that I I'm kind of curious to see like somebody like a Fandango as a single star without that gimmick, you know to see what he's capable of. But I think to start, they should be associated. I mean, you know, they're probably stronger together, especially with so many free agents that are out there now. Um, You know, the, the Bollywood boys, I, I think those guys, especially if you've followed a lot of them, like those guys got into fantastic shape over the past year. And Sunil just wrestled on 205 Live, I think it was two weeks ago, and ended up separating his shoulder and finishing the match. So he had that injury that he's, he's working through, but those guys just seem to be like such, such positive individuals. And you could just see how hard these guys work. And especially when, you know, for, for the Jinder Mahal push, I mean, they were mm-hmm. kind of like a much needed um, assistance for him. I thought during that, that main event run, and they were able to make the most of it. Oh, they, I thought they were a tremendous addition to that act. And I don't think that act like would have been, um, you know, as complete, uh, we, we could say, with, without the two of them. I thought it was kind of perfect casting. But, you know, you look at these two guys, and I don't know if, man, like they had any realistic, I think, thought that they would achieve as much as they had being in this company for as long as they have, you know, be, being able to be in a raw or a smackdown main event with with the wwe champion being out of wrestlemania even so i i I definitely think they could be proud of the run that they've had um and you know they at least to a certain section of the audience i think have at least somewhat made a name for themselves so you know to to a certain demographic i think you know they they certainly hold a lot of like um connection that you might you would assume would be sought after in the wrestling industry yeah, the final point I'll say is that I think the one benefit of this group is the timing that now so many companies are opening up. And even if maybe you're like some of these performers, maybe they're going to get an offer to go do a, a dark or a dark, dark elevation and not necessarily immediately get a deal somewhere. But you have all these other independents that are opening up. And it seems that there is going to be more opportunities if you're willing to go to those places that at least timing wise all these independents, I think they're just going to be looking for people that have some kind of recognition factor, and, and that's what the this list does does entail. The next set of GCW shows will be really interesting, especially like if Matt Cardona is any indication of what sort of like rebrand might be available for people. Um, I I'd be curious to see any of these people in a promotion like that. All right, well. Those are uh, some thoughts on today's unfortunate cuts. And now we are going to resume our previous conversation about all the other news going down on Friday. Hello, everybody. It's a post news update. I'm John Pollock alongside Wei Ting. How are you, Wei? I'm doing all right, John. You know, a bit weird, actually, having this kind of extended period of um, not doing podcasts. With- it's all over the place. I feel we've gone too long, to be honest. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's it's odd to go more than a day, but you know, two days, it maybe even three days if we didn't have this. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are we are coming off what was I will call the the surprising success of the year for us. You and I just talking. I'm amazed by this. I was abs 
there's not too many things that shock me. I definitely was stunned by the amount of feedback to our show on Tuesday. As was I. And again, we want to thank all of our patrons who took the time to listen to it. And not just that, but also told us how much they enjoyed it. It was probably like the most feedback we received for a podcast. Um, and it was also one that... <laughs> a real eye-opener like. that we're, we're doing way too much. <laughs> we could really streamline this to a very simple degree. <laughs> oh, man, we struggle all the time thinking, oh, what are we going to review? What are we going to talk about? Like, you know, like God. all this stuff. What do people actually care about? Turns out they can actually use a little bit of just us talking about nothing. So... Well, we really appreciate it, and we'll definitely look to do more. Yes, yes. We know it's a, it's a balancing act. People would get tired of us, too. So we gotta be got to be smart in all of this. Uh, but thank you. Thank you to everybody uh, that checked out that show. It is up for Post Wrestling Cafe members. I want to mention off the top that if you're listening to this or watching this on Friday, we're not doing our usual Friday night show. Instead, we'll be live Saturday night, 10, 15 p.m. Eastern, to review SmackDown, to review Saturday Night Dynamite, and... Take all of your phone calls. So Saturday night and the next week, we're back to normal. Monday, Wednesday, Friday with the usual shows. Again, that's Saturday, 10, 15 p.m. Eastern for all Post Wrestling Cafe members, postwrestlingcafe.com. All right, let's get into some news from the past couple of days. And today, uh, we'll start things off with the news that was first reported by Sean Ross Sapp at Fightful.com that WWE has released... Raw writer Kenise Mobley, who had gained a lot of attention this week after a podcast she was interviewed for, where she spoke about joining the Raw writing staff over uh, not too long ago and explaining that she was very upfront to WWE during the interviewing process, that she does not come from a pro wrestling fandom and doesn't have a whole lot of knowledge of the product. That was not a deal breaker for WWE at all. Kenise Mobley is an established comedian. She had actually appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon earlier this year. And then in the same interview, she had also been talking about some of the characters on Raw, noting that the WWE champion is Bobby Ashley or Bobby Lashley, which she noted, I should know that. And this gained uh, quite a lot of attention um, that, you know, this member of the writing staff uh, did not know that. Now, Sean Ross Sapp, as well in his reporting, noted that it was not so much the fan backlash uh, that led to this decision. It was more an internal concern. And when I saw that uh, transcript way, like the first thing I thought of was not so much the the wrestling knowledge part, because it, it is not out of the norm that WWE will hire writers that do not have any kind of following of of pro wrestling. That is not some rarity uh, in the company when it comes to their hiring process. And I actually w- was speaking with someone today who told me, like, there have been people with no wrestling backgrounds that have come into the system, learned it, and become very accomplished writers. And on the flip side, they have brought in super fans before as writers, and they have not worked out. So it's always a balance. You want different perspectives, sometimes uh, not coming in with the traditional thoughts and background of pro wrestling. Like WWE looks at that at times as a positive. To me, what the big alarm was, was the fact she did this interview, that I don't think the WWE wants its writers out there doing interviews and very much want their writers to be anonymous. So that is where I thought that the issue would come out of not so much the fact that here's someone with a limited knowledge base. It's the fact that she was out there doing an interview and that just goes to, it's a weird world in WWE that you, it's it's not exactly the same rules that might apply for another television show where she might think it's no big deal to go out and, and do a podcast. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I've listened to the podcast, um, and, um, it, to me, sounded like somebody, by the way, everybody, this podcast came out on June the 6th. I think, um, a lot of the reports were perhaps giving the assumption that this was a podcast that was conducted this week. No, it was conducted on June the 6th when I guess she had recently received her job and it kind of read to me like, or at least sounded to me like, um, Somebody going on a friend's show, I think she was scheduled to join this podcast anyway. It's called the Asian Not Asian Podcast. And as far as I know, it's like sort of a comedian's type of thing. And I think 
she just happened to get a job, you know, and expressed to her friend, hey, just, or at least the friend was like, hey, I heard you just got a new job with the WWE. And then the the conversation that kind of followed it seemed to me almost like, you know, like, John, you got a job at Baskin Robbins. Um, and then, John, you proceeding to be like, yeah, man, I got a job at Baskin Robbins. It's crazy. Like, you know, like, can't name any of the flavors, can't name the best selling flavor. But, you know, it's like people don't see me and don't really think of Baskin Robbins, you know, but it the thing is, what I'm trying to say is. There was a clear I don't blame her whatsoever for taking this job. I don't blame her whatsoever for, um, you know, she was up um, front. I mean, there, there was nothing. Back. She was not deceptive. She or did not. She said that. flat out. This is hey, this so. is my background. And WWE hired her. I mean, th from that sort that aspect of things, I, I don't think any criticism can be warranted. The, the problem comes when you're talking about a position that to the outside world. When there's already plenty of problems with the writing on this show that is being criticized by the audience, you are being put in a position where you're put, putting words into the mouths of people who have worked their lives, their entire lives to get to these positions. And that, when you, to, to be able to be hired and to be, be able to put into that position, no matter what the position may be, she may simply be there to like play ad libs and like fill in the blank, you know, to like in this particular situation. Nonetheless, to... <laughs> I don't think she was aware that she was broadcasting to the audience that she was. I think she was tell telling this to a friend, and 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 that that probably showed a great deal of like you know lack of lack of foresight into throwing this out into the world. But the impression that I think you give to a wrestling fan who is reading this is that this is wrong. This is this should not be happening. Um, you know, again, I don't blame her for getting the job, but I blame the company for making a hire like this. You know, for somebody who doesn't even know the name of the champion, um, it it was appalling to me as a fan. Um, but you know, of course, I feel terrible that a person lost their job. You know, um, I, but per personally, I think it calls more attention to like the hiring process and maybe the lack of transparency about exactly like mm, what exactly is the harm in WWE saying, okay, we want to hire a bunch of different people from different backgrounds because they offer this that a typical wrestling fan does not offer. And I don't even say that more so for me as a fan. I say that more so for the talent that has to work with these people because, I mean, there are reports that um, talent are concerned about people like this writing for them. I, I think certainly you're always, I think, going to have that that resistance from, you know, some some performers and, you know, the, the amount... I mean, let's put this into perspective. Kenise Mobley was not coming in and, <laughs> and putting together next year's WrestleMania program. Okay. She was, you know, but nonetheless, she is going to be tasked with things like writing promos and especially at a lower level where talent is not going to have the same clout to go around or above. And, you know, you, you are a performer that maybe is not, has not met this person yet. And you're, this is your first impression of them. And yeah, I've been working for 10, 15 years, and here I am in the biggest wrestling company in the world, and this person has has uh, some influence over over where my my standing is if I'm if I'm paired w with them. And again, that's not to say that you know you just um, dismiss someone. Like again, I think you're always looking for different perspectives and voices, and I think that's why this release is going to be very polarizing to some because this is a woman of color that that are those are elements that are very underrepresented in professional wrestling. So I think people want to be seeing women of color having positions like this. So this this release, this news is going to be met with with some criticism, but I think it is also uh, goes. Well, well, let me just just stop. I that is absolutely important. I think, though, there needs to be a bar of knowing certain things. You know, like when you're applying for the job, when you're being hired, no matter, I think, what 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 perspective you're, you're, you're tasked to bring on. Like, to me, it's like if somebody didn't know who we were, didn't know our names, and we were looking to hire them as a writer, um, I don't care what sort of perspective they have to offer. Like... It wouldn't happen. 
No, no, that's, you know, and that I, I think has to be part of that I- entire th- discussion point uh, to this. Because we're and big deals. <laughs> I, I think like ultimately, I think this really is just an example of, you know, I I don't think it's all that different than when we look at with the criticisms of Adnan Verk. It's like Adnan Verk came in there with, I'm sure came in with the right attitude, but this is somebody that was learning on the fly and that became very evident. Now that is a front facing individual that's going to be on screen for you. This is someone behind the scenes that is learning on the fly, but they're not all that d- disconnected. And this is like the, this is a gigantic uh, company and that's, that, that's going to come with it. Like, a lot that you are tasked with and the, you know, again, you, you look at, I'm sure there have been examples of people that have come in with no wrestling background and they've succeeded in that system and others that, that have not. So it's, it's, it goes to, you know, what their past experiences have been like and, and wanting to go in different directions. It does not surprise me that WWE I mean, that used to be the joke online is when some of these job postings came up, it would actually say no prior wrestling experience required. And people would point to that. Like there were times WWE actively went for people that maybe did not come in with a historical reference point of pro wrestling, believing we are we are doing something completely different than the wrestling that you might have been accustomed to if you're a fan of multiple decades since childhood. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, internally, I mean, if they've kind of kept that edict up until this point, maybe something is working. Um, I would hope that the reasons, you know, I, I, I don't know. There's no way to tell, like, what her performance was like in the weeks that she was in this position. So I can't really say whether or not that had anything to do with um, her being let go or not. But I, I you know, I, 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 I certainly don't think there'd be any harm in having that transparency with the audience and with your talents to say, Hey, we are looking for people of all this, all levels of experience and all levels of familiarity with, with our product. Um, and that includes people who evidently can't even name the champion. Like if that is their choice, that is their choice. But I, I think having you, some level of think, con- conversation with the audience is not going to be a bad thing. Do you think that it would at all benefit WWE not not necessarily having somebody that's a recent hire being put out there, but having some presence of your creative staff that is like your your head writer that can go out and do these interviews that could add mm-hmm. a lot more to the process. Because I think one of the issues that WWE creative faces is that it's largely a committee of faceless, nameless individuals that the audience just pelts their criticism at and they have no chance to explain stories, explain the process. Now, I know everything I'm saying is so counter to the Vince McMahon philosophy of not wanting any spotlight on that type of thing, but the creative process is something that gets maligned pretty consistently and it's not just a fan thing. And that's why I go to the feedback to fans like the WWE does not put a ton of stock in just fan complaints, but when it's reaching your financial analysts and it's coming up on investors calls, that's why I thought the hire of Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff, I thought part of it would be a strategy that you can send these people out as your representatives to speak on behalf of the company, but the creative is kind of just this mysterious element of the company that the audience doesn't get to ever hear their perspective on things. Uh, if, if you're, you know, suggesting would, would that level of discourse be helpful to a fan's, um, maybe, you know, to maybe even like quell a a situation like this from happening in the future? Absolutely. Yes. You know, like I've been following all of these, covering all of these MCU shows and with every single iteration of them, the writers and the producers do endless amounts of media talking about the production process. And in the end, like not all of it's great. Not all the shows are great. They have to field criticism. But they do it in their own way that controls the narrative and gives their a perspective of the message. And in the end, it creates a deeper connection with your audience and the product. And T- Tony know, Khan, like, I think that's a Tony certain Khan. appeal to AEW is that Tony Khan is out there and he's going to talk about all the stories. And you can, whether you're a fan or not, 
you cannot deny the passion that that guy conveys in any of his interviews that I think it, it extends to his fan base that here is somebody that is such a big fan of his own product. And you're not going to get Vince McMahon performing that role. But is there an in-between individual that can go out there and really sell the stories and not so much going through like the, the process that I think would be you know crazy to explain, but just having more of a little bit of that creative process, like you've cited with a lot of these MCU series. I think Triple H is very aware of that. You know, the man continues to do mm-hmm. these these uh, conference calls, and I think he totally understands what you know. Um, uh, fandom is like in the 21st century. You know, when audiences are going to like, would you rather allow your audience to just speculate wildly, or would you like some sort of discourse to be able to at least you know give your perspective about about things, whether or not he's he's bullshitting like you know some some of the time. No, 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 Which less, you're like, going to get with, with any of these people, whether it's politics, John. Exactly, yeah. of course. Like, uh, politics, yes, from Paul Levesque. But um, no, it's certainly like it's going to be a very WWE pr- perspective. But, but some is I mean, better than none. Well, that's it. It's like I would say for your, your creative process, like if this is a real negative, like there is like a PR element to WWE being incentivized to have, you know, whether it be your you know, a representative just on the creative level that can go out and do select interviews with major media outlets. Imagine if this story was framed a different way where like, hey, uh, hey, uh, here I am, uh, you know, waiting, uh, head writer, WWE Raw, here to announce a brand new hire. We have somebody really exciting. She comes from a Tonight Show background. She's a, you know, very, very good co- comedian writer. Her wrestling knowledge is not that great, but we're going to get her up to speed. But we hired her because she brings a very fresh perspective on characters that we sorely lack uh in representation like that would totally change the story and obviously uh, you know it would also have to come with not her her not appearing on a podcast saying uh bobby ashley bobby lashley but you know clearly like that that might have been the reason why they hired her like internally all those conversations probably took place but because i think so much of the audience is left in the dark so much of the talent seemingly is left in the dark about something like that The reaction is going to be far different, and it ultimately makes everybody look bad. Uh, Let's move on. We'll stay in WWE. They've announced uh, several um, events. They are going to be returning to the UK in September. They've announced four dates. This will be their first UK tour since November of 2019. They're going to be running September 19th through the 22nd with stops in Newcastle and London, England, Cardiff, Wales, and then concluding in Glasgow, Scotland. So uh, I guess... Martin and Benno maybe will be doing some live on the spot reporting. Um, I, I you'll have to you'll have to get them to agree to that one. I guess it's good. It's going to be SmackDown shows, so it will be. Yeah, they've announced uh, some of the talent that will be attached to these shows. Uh, more uh, interesting. I, I, uh, well, I, I was going to say, you know, I'll, I would assume maybe some NXT UK roster integration and in some of the dark matches, maybe even on the shows themselves, you would you would hope, perhaps? Possibly. Yeah, I, I could see that being unless they want to just keep them completely, you know, WWE main roster centric. Uh, PW Insider uh, was the first to report that. They will be going to Madison Square Garden on Friday, September the 10th. Uh, I was able to confirm this date. And in the latest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, it had stated that Maroon 5 had this date. And then they canceled it. And the WWE was able to come in and grab that date, uh, which is just going to be days prior to the AEW show in Newark on September 15th. And then the bigger one at Arthur Ashe Stadium, September 22nd. Uh, Newark is a case where all these tickets have already been sold. And a lot of people who bought the initial Newark show in March of 2020 have just held on to those tickets. So I don't see that being a show that's really going to make any difference here. Um, But certainly people are going to look at how close in proximity this comes to the Arthur Ashe Stadium event. Um, And I mean, that's where I mean, this will be the, uh, the Battle of New York in September. You know, it's the company's home turf, um, or at least that's how they see it. And here are some invaders. Um, but you know, if you're WWE, like this, this sort of behavior is really not un- unusual. And you know what? We, I guess, we have to thank Maroon Five for canceling their spot so that WWE can. Uh, that would resume. be a first because I've never thanked Maroon Five for anything in my life. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, well, oddly, oddly enough, you know what? Uh, maybe Tony Khan would have to like, you know, get the, get some new entrance music for a for a fellow wrestler. Please from, don't from Adam Levine. Um, but yeah, no, a a, a broadcast show in, a, a, from MSG is it, it, very very rare for the company and very expensive when you're running TV at Madison Square Garden. So, so what exactly? What do you know? What the deal? Why it's more expensive? Is it like rights or like it's like it's like union costs in in New York that that come with all of this. So it's like it's and it's just it's an expensive building to rent for just from the whatever you're running. Um, MSG MSG. is uh, it might be the most. uh, I remember at a time at least reading that it was the most expensive building uh, to rent. That might still be the case. I have to say, I don't think it'll really hurt the Arthur Ashe show for AEW. You know, I think anytime that it, it, there's the narrative that's provided of like WWE somehow like pulling a move on AEW, you know, the underdog that's just trying to like, you know, like create create a bit of a foothold. I think it it'll create more um, motivation for people to you know show that AEW can be successful running two two shows back to back in the in a ser- near vicinity. So I think it. I, I don't think I think there'll be different audiences if anything. I, I see both shows doing very well. WWE's first show back at the Garden for TV. Um, like who knows like what talent they'll have on SmackDown by that point. I think it's going to do really well, and I think our, Arthur Ashe Stadium is going to do very well. I think that is a was a really wise location scouting maneuver by AEW to book that because that seems like a really cool venue to see what it's going to look like. Like it really takes you back to WCW when they would experiment with different non-traditional wrestling venues and just the look and feel of a show is enticing. And that definitely seems to be an attribute that Tony Khan has picked up. I wonder if it'll be open air that day. Well, it's, it's got a retractable roof. So based on the weather, they, they have that option. Mm, Interesting. Something to watch. Um, a few days ago, Melissa Coates passed away. Uh, she was someone, actually a native of Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, that had grown up. She was an aspiring tennis player and then got significantly involved in the world of bodybuilding, uh, participating in many contests in the province and then going professional uh, around 1995 and then uprooted herself from Canada and went to Los Angeles. And she ended her bodybuilding career in 1999. This was after competing in uh, Miss Olympia, Miss International, and got involved in professional wrestling, training at Killer Kowalski School, uh, spent some time in UPW, which was uh, Rick Bassman's group at the uh, Ultimate University there. And then she worked in OVW, Although when she first went there, it's when WWF did have the relationship with OVW, but she did not have a developmental deal at that point. And I don't know if she eventually got one when she went to, she would go to Deep South as well, which was another uh, developmental group. And then uh, got involved after leaving Deep South. She kind of just went around the independence for a long time, didn't really get a big break in pro wrestling. She made an appearance on a, on a WWE pay-per-view in 2005 And then became the super genie with Sabu. And that was what she had been doing for the last, um, since 2014. And then had a really unfortunate uh, health scare last year where she had contracted these blood clots in her leg. And it led to the amputation of her left leg uh, above the knee and was, you know, in a wheelchair after there had been um, some photos afterwards. And, you know, just I'm sure the last uh, six months eight months ha- had been a, a very, very difficult uh, period for her after, after going through all of that. Uh, just, you know, very sad news, not someone that had a large um, break in professional wrestling, but someone who had, you know, you could just see from some of the reactions from people she had wrestled. Uh, this was interesting, wrestled Bailey in Bailey's like first ever match. And it just seemed like she, you know, Kept in touch with a lot of people that she worked with in the wrestling industry. Seemed to be a very nice individual, but uh, some someone that I never interacted with. But it was uh, an unfortunate story this past week. Yeah, our condolences. You know, very young, and um, you know, never you want to hear it. I mean, I'm not so familiar with her career, unfortunately, but um, no doubt um, she will be missed by the people uh, she was closest to. Tonight on SmackDown, they have announced uh, a Roman Reigns victory celebration after last week. Maybe he's going to celebrate SmackDown topping 2 million viewers last week with the Hell in a Cell match. Um, 
Yeah, sure. Why not? Just as good of a reason as any. Can't get that Showbuzz Daily screen grab, but maybe they can go to, I don't know, like Spoiler TV or Brandon Thurston screen grab. One of those. Sure. Uh, then we've also got a Money in the Bank qualifying match between Apollo Crews and Big E. A dream match. Mm. Yep. I believe this is their seventh singles match this year. Well, I mean, at least there's something at stake, you know. And if there is something at stake. Something as 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 you know, uh, something like a qualifying match. I don't really mind seeing some uh, a rematch. And then we've also got a a rare intergender match. It's going to be Seth Rollins and Bailey against Bianca Belair and Cesaro. And those are the only announcements we have thus far for SmackDown. Uh, over on Dynamite on Saturday night, we've had uh, several additions. So the updated lineup is Kenny Omega Jungle Boy for the AEW title, Hangman Page against Powerhouse Hobbs, Matt Seidel versus Dante Martin, Chris Statlander versus The Bunny, Ethan Page against Bear Bronson, and a face-to-face involving Tully Blanchard and Conan. That sounds great. I have no idea what that's going to be like, but yes, it sounds awesome. Great. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah, it could be completely off the rails or it could be, you know, it's a live show, isn't it? It's a live show Saturday night and then they'll be live again on Wednesday for their last show at Daly's Place, at least for for the time being. So, yeah, it'll be a quick turnaround for Dynamite and they've already got several announcements for next Wednesday's show. And then the last thing is uh, on the MMA side of things, Bellator announced today they will hold their first card in Russia October 23rd, headlined by Fedor Emelianenko, opponent TBA. And Fedor, he has not fought since the end of 2019 when he beat Quentin Jackson. He's going to be 45 by the time this fight takes place, October 23rd. And I, he had COVID earlier this year and was hospitalized as a result of it. So, I mean, it sounded like he had it on the, the worst end. Um, but he is coming back for another fight. This will be on Showtime and they made that announcement today. But a a pretty busy weekend. We've got PFL and Bellator tonight, which, do you know why this is going to be historic? Why is that? We are going to have a PFL report on the site from Eric Marcotte. Ooh, awesome. We sat down, we put our brains together. We're like, you know what? This PFL card, I think, is bigger than the Bellator one. So we are going to get PFL coverage tonight on the site uh, with Kayla Harrison fighting. And then Saturday, there is an afternoon card from the UFC with Alexander Volkov versus Cyril Gaon, which I'm hoping there's a knockout in the first minute with Cyril getting his arm raised so that the headline I can put on Eric's report is gone in 60 seconds, Mm. which I started watching this week. Oh, yeah. Wow. What a a kind of a strange... Like what? Did you just have that in your like watch list for the longest time? And it's been it's been on my DVR for months. Not not months. At least uh, a couple weeks actually. Okay. So I started watching it. It's taken me right back to the summer of two thousand. How are you going to watch F nine? Or do you plan to watch F nine? I'm not. Listen, I I had this discussion. Okay, I had I had this offline discussion with uh, some of the members of the Post family. And number one, I can't legally watch it here in Canada. And to be honest, so, so you so you can't like buy it off of some premium service, like not that I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't looked too deep into it, but I don't think legally you can get it yet in Canada. And this is one movie I don't want to watch on my laptop. I do want to watch this in the theater, but I don't know when that's going to be. That could be a while. Yeah, but I think Benno is going to see it this weekend. A lot of people I think are probably going to see it this weekend. I believe there are drive-throughs, but I mean I don't even know how to find like. Yeah, drive throughs was probably your your only option in, in Canada. Yeah, like a bunch of drive-ins are advertised, but like, yeah, fortunately, I don't really see the premium steps. Although I'm sure uh, somebody, you know, you guys don't need to send me a link or anything. I'm okay. I've never gone to a drive-in in my life. Really? I'm sure it's fun. It's just that's never there was never like a convenient location for me to go to one, and I just uh, have never never done it. Yeah, why would you if like you could just walk to the theater and like have a seat, right? I don't know if I'd want to sit in my car for two hours with the audio on. Like, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's like sitting in your car. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, for Fast 9, I think it would be a, a great choice, actually. Oh, it could be dangerous. Probably get people revving their <laughs> engines and shit. Don't realize that they're they're in neutral. Honking. Yeah, honking and shit. Yeah. Sounds like a bad idea. Well, uh, you know, if you do see it, um, enjoy yourselves this weekend. 
that that is true. So uh, that's going to wrap things up. Uh, I'm going to have a news update later on today, uh, writing about the 45th anniversary of Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki. Wow, awesome! Very yes, cool. and you, and also you've got post pro wrestling coming up on Sunday. That's right. That's right. Sunday, we uh, WH and I will reunite. Uh, so you'll get plenty of John Pollock this weekend. We'll be live Saturday night. I'll be back Sunday night. And you have a MCU later up on the site. I guess this was a divisive episode. I have not seen episode three yet of Loki, but it sounds like there's mixed reviews. You know, uh, con- compared to the other two, definitely. A-, a lot more people may be being critical of this one, but I happen to quite enjoy it. And you have to find out what WH thinks. You know, it's kind of interesting having these little... Like, we, we get to share WH now, you and I, John. You know, I have my time with him. He's like our, like a kid, you know, like, like, and we're like parents that are split up. Like, I get my weekdays with him. You get your weekends with him. Take yeah, care of you, him, okay? Yeah, you get to chat about uh, comics and Marvel and all those things. And then I get to talk with him about uh, his views on the state of New Japan. So, Well, there's plenty of cussing in MCU later as well from WH. So, Oh, well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad, I'm glad, glad he's on brand. Uh, so that's going to wrap things up. Thanks to everybody for tuning into this Post News update. Again, we're live Saturday night, 10, 15 p.m. Eastern for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. We will be taking your calls, so we look forward to hearing and seeing from many of you on Saturday night. So goodbye and have a wonderful weekend.